to you and our special guest is on board, Jack O'Sullivan. Jack, you are an environmental scientist. That's I've, right, Ray. I've never met one before. Well, now that's amazing because I think some people think there's too many of them around and the country is full of them. Well, I suppose I am an environmental scientist. I am actually because I started off as a marine biologist in Cork. Right. And you might wonder why I ended up in Wallingar, and it's a great story. I was over in England for a while. I was a fishery officer. I right. came back to Dublin, and I lived for a number of years there. And a very good friend of mine said, come and live in Westmeath. She said, it's a great place. Right. So I thought, hmm, I'll give it a try. And you've, you've, uh, you've, you've travelled to uh, Castle Pollard is where your abode is now, yeah? Uh, very close to it. Mm -hmm. I lived for a while with my nearest and dearest, my yeah. significant other, as they say these days. Right. We hired a flat in Tullinally Castle, and our neighbours were Thomas and Valerie Packenham. <sighs> Go on. And that was lovely. That gave me an idea, really, of how the barracks should be like here. Ah. And then we bought a little house out in a place called Valley Manus, north of Castle Pollard. But since coming back to Ireland in 1975, I've done a lot of planning work. I did, didn't do any more marine biology. Okay. Nearly all planning, environmental science, policy analysis, all that kind of stuff. Very interesting. I, I work as a freelance consultant. At the moment, I have to say I'm overwhelmed with work. I don't want any more. I'm not looking for more work at all. I have enough to keep me going until about July of this year. Wow. Uh, we're here in the barracks of Mullingar, and uh, it's... It's a beautiful place. There's a oh, magnificent yeah. feeling about being up here because this is the highest ground in Mullingar. Uh, we've done a few different videos. Of different. We were with Ruth here, Ruth Illingworth, who gave us a history lesson. We were in the boxing club. We mm. were introduced there. And then we were in with Helen... Um, uh, Helen, Aud Helen Donnelly. Uh, Donnelly, that's oh, right. He's the person who got me involved in this. Right. It was about two and a half years ago, Helen and I met... And she told me that she was uh, working in the barracks at Skills Exchange and she was going to get together a group of people. Mm -hmm. So that kind of got me going. Right. I came in and I saw this place and I fell in love with it. Go in. Because I had a vision, which is now our vision statement put together by Helen, myself, by Andrea, by Louis um, Peppard, by all the... 15, 16, 17, 18 people who are members of the Column Barracks Restoration and Regeneration Committee. And what we want to do really, what we want to see is the barracks turned into a centre, full of people, lots of activity, all the little groups which are presently here, I think there's 23, 24 of them at the moment, wow. repairing bicycles, um, the boxing club, the recording studio, the St. Vincent de Paul, all continuing, but more coming as well. I could see, for example, a, a room or two for the Lithuanians, another group for the Polish people, um, something else for the Goel Goiri, um, women's clubs, everything. And then that wouldn't take up the entire space because mm -hmm. I think there was about 300 soldiers at one stage lived here. That's right. And you need people here day and night as well. So our idea is that some of the buildings would be turned into apartments for old soldiers, for families, for people. And these wouldn't be sold off now to a builder to do it at great profit. This would be done by young lads working as trainees, learning about roofing and slating and plastering. Which they can't like. do at the moment. There's no place in Mullingar you can go to learn um, how to do roofs and slates and, and um, really? plumbing and electricity. You can apprentice to a guy. Yeah. But you can't actually go to a technical school that doesn't do that kind of stuff. And we really need that in Mullingar. And what we also want to see is all the buildings insulated inside so that use very little energy and all the energy that we'd use here would come from the sun, from solar panels on the roofs, um, various different means of, of getting that what we call renewable energy. And we've got money from the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland Already? to a master energy plan for the entire place. Um, but the, do they work, them things that, that take the light, the, the, oh, them panels? Oh, they do, Ray. I have two sets of them on our house. In 2010, we put up what are called solar thermal evacuated tubes. Right. And every year since then, from May to October, we've had hot water. They just heat the water. That's all they do. And last, two years ago, 2019, we got in solar photovoltaic. And we're generating a good few kilowatts of power 
every single day that it's nice and bright like today now we might generate three or four kilowatts the only problem we have and everyone in this area has mm -hmm. is the excess electricity which we don't need goes off to ESB Electric Ireland air grid and at the moment we don't get paid for it but we're told at the end of this year we will be getting paid for that so this is you're generating in your house you're generating electricity that is exactly. being wasted exactly Literally. Literally. Now we have so, a battery, so the battery kind of will last us till about 9 or 10 at night. Yeah. But if we're cooking something in the oven, it might only last maybe till 7 or 8 in the evening. But these days now, the long days and the bright days, it doesn't mm -hmm. even have to be sunny. It's bright. We're getting great electricity. We have seven, 14 panels up there. And do you intend to try and do this here in, um, in the barracks? We want to. Yeah. Now, it's a listed building. We need to protect it. And so we are... are um, how would I put it? Restricted what we can do. Yeah. But there's a lot of place in some of these small buildings, for example, around to the left of us here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn yeah. our camera around, right? Oh, sure. And just give people an idea of uh, the ideas that are involved in... Uh, so let me see if we're looking at the building with the trees there, I think, yeah. So that building with the trees is one of the buildings that the work has been done on. Yes, that's a modern building. Okay, um, so there's one block there, there's two blocks there. This is the block that Helen is in as well. Yes, that's right, the block we're facing now. Yeah. And uh, Helen just... and a lot of other people as well. Do you know what the lovely thing about this place is? Mm -hmm. I imagine that if myself and herself living out there six miles north of Castle Pollard, we're dependent on the car for everything. But let's say 10 years time. Yeah. We find we can't drive us too much of a drag. Mm -hmm. We might come in here and rent an apartment. And you know, if we did that, we'd be sitting out here in the sun. There'd be old soldiers in one apartment, people like Robert and Noel. And we'd be saying, hello, how are you? Sit down, have a nice chat. Then there'd be kids around. Then we'd go across to the barber shop, have a haircut. Right. Or go up to Burnley for a massage. Or go out to the field. You know, the camp field is a lovely yeah. place. We have an idea there to turn that into a market garden wow. where people would be learning horticulture how to grow vegetables how to grow fruit and what happened to all that vegetables and fruit there'd be a shop here where you come in and get homegrown vegetables and fruit grown by people being trained to do that and we'd have a little forest out there in the camp field um, and you could go and have a quiet walk among trees if you felt a little bit you needed a bit of nature yeah. People do need to be close to nature, you know. And, and, and as well as that, like with Helen's place there, we were watching before, that, that they're going to generate that building, get that one up and running, and then start moving the whole way around um, the, the barracks. Stage by stage, Ray, that's exactly it. We have to be take it bit by bit, because to, to fix up the entire place would cost an awful lot of money. But what we'd be looking for is grants from Europe, from the state and so on. We have got money from the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, mm -hmm. but we need more as well. But there's a problem. There's always a hitch somewhere. Yeah. And the county council are decent people in there, in the, in the county offices, mm -hmm. but they haven't quite seen our vision yet. Okay. And there's a crowd up in Dublin, an office called the Land Development Agency. Mm -hmm. And they are not quite seeing, the, they're not too far away from us in right. theory and in thinking. But they're chatting anyway. But they're talking, we're talking. Yeah. To them. And they're very much stuck with their own legislation which says build houses and build as many as you can. Yeah. And where we're saying, look, there's plenty of places you can build houses in Mullingar. There's nearly a thousand vacant houses here and there's a loads of places which are bought by speculators and developers and never built on. Right. And I would say um, the government or the state or the county council purchase them, mm -hmm. comp compulsory purchase if necessary. Yeah. Because we have a housing crisis and if you have a crisis then you need to do something and certainly to, to buy that land and build houses on that. But at the same time, have some of these buildings you're now looking at now with the camera, some of these buildings with people living in them. And if you went to, say, Trinity College, you find that buildings like this, early 18th century buildings or 19th century buildings, turned into student accommodation, turned into places where you can have rooms for lecturing offices, yeah. but have a diversity. 
everything integrated, like the market garden will supply training, um, it will supply organic food for the shop, maybe have a baker here operating something, have the church as a multi-denominational, non-denominational church, people go for oh, That's right, yeah, we'll go down by, we'll down by that in a few minutes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, kind of stuff, that's you know? fair enough, but I mean, so it'd be able to, like, is there going to be money made off this, or is it literally going to sustain itself and um, without anyone so fair enough it's going to need a little bit of help from yeah. Europe and a little bit of help from the council and a little bit of help from everyone in general so it'll end up a community of its own up here correct. is that correct but with outreach to Mullingar so I could see Frick, or we could see our committee could see people coming in from Mullingar to buy organic vegetables to buy bread to get training um, to go for courses to go for lectures anything going on here yeah now initially a place like this will require a lot of money but the whole idea is that it would be two ways economically viable meaning eventually it will pay for itself mm -hmm. people would be renting apartments uh, the businesses would be paying money as well but not only uh, economically viable but sustainable right which means no fossil fuels no carbon dioxide emissions Remember, we're heading into a climate change crisis, Ray. Uh -huh. And we've got to cut down on almost 100% on our carbon dioxide emissions within the next 12 years because climate change, my God, I'm reading about it almost every day, mm -hmm. is going faster and faster than we ever imagined before. Glaciers are melting, the sea level is rising, seas are getting warmer, it's just coming like a damned express train. But we're hard on the we're hard on the world ourselves, aren't we? That's the problem, Ray. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head. We are too hard on the world. Mm -hmm. We've filled the oceans with plastic, we've filled the air with carbon dioxide, which is like a big thick blanket over us, and we're losing species at a terrible rate of extinction. And at the same time, you know, we haven't enough land for farming, and we're taking more land for farming, and the land we've got for farming, we're damaging it. So we're not doing well as a species, and it's bad. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, as I said, it's uh, this is our our program today. As I say, we're with Jack O'Sullivan, uh, environment. Uh, you're a scientist, I'm a scientist and a scientist. I've always believed in science because you know scientists always query things and they're always curious yeah. how does this work how does that work what happens if we do something else and tell me how did you get into science i mean you came from cork is it cork city cork city at the edge of cork city that's the church you're looking at now it's a lovely yeah, building it's absolutely fantastic at the edge of cork city i grew up there near the keys down by um the southern keys and i was mad about ships if you look at my school books you'll find drawings of ships all over them and i wanted to go to sea right as a youngster yeah and the parents very wisely said go on now and get your college degree before you go to sea they said wow so i got that college degree and i did biochemistry and zoology and that's kind of doing environmental science but i was still very keen on going to sea and it turned out that the very first job I got was a sea fishery officer. Right. In England. <laughs> now, there's dozens of people in England as good as I am or better than environmental science. Yeah. But you know, there's a story here, Ray. What got me the job was this. Growing up in Cork, I was mad to have a boat. And we, the family we bought, just myself was the only, only child. We bought a boat for 15 pounds. Right. She was a 13 and a half foot wooden clinker built rowing boat. Wow. And I put a mast and a sail on her. Mm -hmm. And with a, with a friend from school, didn't we sail off down the entire coast of West Cork in a 13 and a half foot boat? Wow. Heading out of Cork Harbour and going on down through Court McSherry, Glandore, uh, Mill Cove, Trelong Bay. All those places, down nearly as far as Skibbereen. We'd take about two weeks sailing and rowing. And never in danger much, because we were never far from the coast. And I could handle a boat. I learned to handle a boat in, any, in good, bad weather and bad. Yeah. And the lecturer in UCC in Cork, right. when he was asked to uh, give a reference for this fellow, yeah. himself, he said he can handle a boat under any kind of weather conditions. And that got me the job in England. Wow. And it was great because I used to go out in a small boat, take samples of water, 
Rowan, we'd I was working with a man who was the kind of chief fishery officer there, and we'd s analyze the, the seawater, and I the kind of work I was doing now would be analyzing sewage, analyzing mm -hmm. um, industrial waste, analyzing seawater, looking at the number of mussels and cockles that could be extracted safely from the big mussel beds and cockle beds in Morecambe Bay, and Liverpool Bay, and North Wales, and uh, chasing up oil slicks. And I really enjoyed it, but you know, a job kind of, you do your life, it's your first job and you spend, I was there about, let me see, about six years. That's okay. a long time for your first job. And I got another job then with a big consultancy firm. And you know what, again, kind of, it was lucky, I found that I want to get back into academic life. You know, most youngsters, I think, oh, you'll, you'll get back into university and do some teaching. Right. Nobody wanted me. Because, Ray, I wasn't a specialist. Okay. I wasn't a specialist. Ah, right. I didn't have the PhD in the left hind leg of the rarest beetle in Ireland, but I knew about chemistry, about engineering, about water treatment, about local government, about tides and rivers and estuaries and the sea. I found myself in a consultancy firm. And they were a lovely firm, really firm. And the, the boss there... I remember his advice to me, he said, when a client rings you up and asks you to do a job, yeah. he, he said, D don't say, well, we might do it. Or think about it, say, of course we'll do it. We'll do the job. And then you figure out later how to do it. Exactly. And Confidence straight away. That's good advice. Right? So, uh, so you ended up at sea. Is this the sea job or did you go uh, to college and then back to sea? No, I was in college first, then the fishery officer job. Okay. I'd be out in the fisheries patrol vessel in Liverpool Bay and Morecambe Bay. Right. Then the consultancy job R in England. Okay. And then, you know, the green tinted glasses were on me all the time. And I want to get back to Ireland. Right. And a job came up in the National Science Council for a science policy analyst. Wow. And this job was in, there was about six or seven of those jobs. They were part, they were full time, but they were two year contracts. And they arose because in the early 1970s, mm -hmm. Sinn Féin had said in a pamphlet called Era Nua, why doesn't the government bring back from overseas Irish scientists who worked and got experience? And the government at the time rubbished it. Right. And two years later, they implemented it, which is always the case in politics. One party says it, the other party rubbishes it, but quietly they implement it. Right. And there's a man at the time called Justin Keating. I have great admiration for him. Mm -hmm. He was a vet by profession. He was one of our good, good ministers. He set up the National Science Council. I had a two-year contract there. And I didn't do much science policy analysis, even though that was my title. Okay. I ended up going across to Brussels every month, sometimes two, twice a month, because we had joined the European community. Wow. And scientists were needed to serve as committees and to represent Ireland at this, that and the other committee. And you'd go over there and you'd spend eight hours a day with your headphones on, sitting in a room, listening to people uh, being translated to you into English and so on but it was a great experience it really really was it was quite small at that time as well i mean it the was. whole thing has branched out into a whole nest oh, yes. of Huge. it's a very very big now but at that time uh, it was it was very very fresh and uh, it, it must have been a fantastic time to be in europe at that time it was great and i loved being in europe because mm -hmm. you know the irish civil service are some lovely people I mean, very um how do i put it very Byzantine at times, you mm -hmm. know. There's a lot of stuff going on under the surface and you see people gazumping other people and somebody's doing the dirty on someone else. But you meet lovely people there. That's right, yeah. Uh... And at the same, I remember seeing a big fight. Um, it was about aquaculture. And fish farming was coming in as a new, new technology. Right. National Science Council boss said, that's our area. We'll do that. We'll take care of that. Okay. Board Iskivara, the Irish Sea Fisheries Board, said, oh, no, that's our area. <laughs> the Department of Fisheries said, hang on, that's our that's area. That's our area. Well, the memos that went between them, you know, the paper must have been hot. <laughs> Eventually, the National Science Council won it. They were given a job, and they appointed four sea fishery, mariculture, aquaculture development officers who did great work. And then you know what happened? The next head of the National Science Council came from the IDA, former IDA man, mm -hmm. good man. He said, what's all this stuff about fish farming? 
well, our job is to bring in modern, high-tech industry. Get rid of it. So they got rid of it. So having won, the main thing was win the territory. Don't worry too much about what you do with the territory. But the thing was winning. That was very important. But it's a great lesson because working in the public service, you're part of a big club. That's right, yeah. People in there might have their own little bickering now and again. Mm -hmm. But on the whole, they're trying to do their best. And there's some great people. You'll meet a few awful people as well. But you meet 99% of them are very good. And I still um, have a lot of interaction with Westmeath County Council. Some great people there. There's a few difficult people too as well. And I have great, a lot of interaction with the onboard Planola with the EPA because a lot of my work now since I came to West Meath Ray is planning. Planning, yeah. That keeps me, that keeps the bread and butter on the table. Planning, planning is still, uh, there's plenty of planning out there or the cutting back on planning. And the, someone says they're trying to get everyone into cities now and towns yeah. and get them out of the fields. Is, uh, this is the problem because yeah. we ourselves, myself and my nearest and dearest, we're out in the country six kilometres north of Castle Pollard. Mm -hmm. You know, we're car dependent. On the other hand, we're not dependent on anything else because we have half an acre of ground. Mm -hmm. We're growing some, uh, we have some fruit trees, some vegetables. We have solar panels on the roof for electricity and water heating. Mm -hmm. We have our own well. Mm -hmm. We bought a little house that had a well in it. And we get rid of our own sewage through our septic tank. Right, so we're not quite self sufficient. And we want to do that here as well in the barracks. I, my yeah. image would be to get in Briadie's well drilling, let them drill down a hole. Yeah. I was told that the cost of the water here from Irish water, when the soldiers were here, was tens of thousands a year. Oh. It. So I'd say, let's get in Briadie's well, well drilling or any other crowd, yeah. drill a deep borehole, maybe down, maybe 50 or 100 metres, down at the rock, get in some, up some lovely clean water, like we have out in, in, in And do you think there's clean water in there? Can only be, uh, we'd only know that if we drill down into the rock. Itself. If we drill down into the rock. And then we put in the, where the camp field is now, we put in what they call a, a constructed wetland. Okay. Like a, they used to call them reed beds. But I've helped um, two firms now install constructed wetlands. And they are lovely. They actually clean up the sewage beautifully. Wow. And uh, that then becomes a kind of a wildlife area as well. So this gives an idea here. Wetland, attracting birds. I'm just seeing that the width of these buildings. Um, oh, great buildings, aren't they? I've never been down this way. You can drive around here now. Yeah. Oh my God! There's a whole load of stuff down here and as well. There's a wonderful place too, Ray, where there's an old boiler house, and all this place is centrally heated. Great. It was. And you know what I'd love to see? This is what I learned in Germany from a visit there, and I learned. Down in the eco village in Clough Jordan as well. Mm -hmm. Went to a, a village in, in Germany in 2002. Right. And we were shown this um, this uh, community hall, and we said how he was showing us how it was heated. And it was heated by wood chip. Ah, wood chip yes, indeed. Lorry. Not wood pellet now, ordinary old wood chip. And the lorry discharged it into a grating down into a kind of a cellar and it was carried into a furnace and heated. And I asked an awful stupid question, Ray. I said, how much do you pay for your wood chip? Yeah. And the German man folded his arms and looked at me and said, it comes from our community forest. I thought, my God, the village has a community forest. And I didn't ask the next question, which I should have, because I was too taken aback. I would have said, well, do you pay local men to do it, or is it a contractor, or is it done, done by voluntary labour? Yeah. But down in Clough Jordan Eco Village in Tipperary, they have the same type of system a big uh, boiler house, uh, wood chip is delivered from by a lorry, mm -hmm. maybe 10 tons at a time, I don't know. A couple of the people living in the Eco Village is a retired engineer, he looks after it. It heats the entire village wow. very, very cheaply. And from timber that would not be used for anything else, chopped up little bits of old, what we call forest thinnings, chipped, chipped wood as well. So that's how I'd heat this place with solar energy, wood chips, uh, forest thinnings, 
and basically pipe the heat around every building. Wait, and the pipes are already there, I think. I think so, yeah. Well, they might be a little bit old, but still, I'd say they it'd would still be, be all right. Old, you know, they'd be all right as well. And, and it needs a lot of technology, a lot of technical people to look at it. We've got two architects now in our um, column barracks committee. We have a young engineer as well. We have designers. We have a great crowd of people. But we have to convince the land development agency that we actually know more than they do. That's difficult when you're dealing with civil servants from Dublin. Uh -huh. They like to think they know more. Yeah, well, as I said, it's just a case of keep hammering away at the rock. It is. And uh, that is, as I said, what's the most important thing. But look, uh, thank you very, very much for being on board the bus. A great pleasure. A pleasure to chat to you, sir. And uh, as I say, we do it... Uh, sometimes we do the show at different places and today we're doing it in a totally different place. It's Colin Barracks. Uh, we're here with Jack Sullivan, environmental scientist and a man that can talk, I think, all day, no problem. <laughs> and, much. Uh, but Too no, much. but the beauty of it is it's very articulate and it's very informative. And I think that's the that's a fantastic trait that you have, sir. Uh, whoever gave it to you, um, you'll have to bless them. It must be your mother, as I say. Uh, she was a good woman, but the only thing is, don't ever call me sir. I never, I don't like being called sir. To me, well, that's we're all sort of... equal. Every one of us is equal. Well, anyway. anyway, Jack, thank you very, very much for being on board. And as I said, we're going live with the 12 bongs. And as I said, it's great to be here in Colin Barracks. Uh, in the future, hopefully, uh, should we say hopefully, or in the future, this is going to be a thriving uh, metropolis. It'll be a thriving hub that'll put Mullingar on the map if we've anything at all to do with it. There you are. Last word from Jack. Good luck to you all, folks, and thanks Good for looking in. Ray. Thank you, Jack. And uh, just check out here what we got. Uh, oh, stick. Uh, hang on, let me see if we get this right. Yes, and we check that one. And hold on, now we'll check. We'll check this one up here. There you are, folks.